colleagues, I'll ask those of you to please take your seats. We'll start shortly. Great. Well, uh, a very warm welcome, both here in the room and online. Uh, I'm Rebecca Joven. I'm the chief of the Vienna office for the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. We're really delighted to have the special event in our Vienna conversation series today um, with participation both here at the Vienna International Center and um, lots of uh, colleagues and friends tuning in online from across the world. So uh, I'm particularly delighted that this Vienna conversation series event is being hosted uh, in partnership with the Republic of Ireland and with the United Nations Information Service here in Vienna. So um, we're really happy that we have a chance to uh, to use today for um, what has become uh, a series of discussions around different topical issues facing disarmament, arms control, and nonproliferation. And today is no exception as we look at the issue of humanitarian um, disarmament and uh, look at the crucial role that humanitarian perspectives and principles have played um, historically and continue to play and the importance that the UN Secretary General attaches to these issues that our office, the Office for Disarmament Affairs, attaches to these issues and the importance um, of these dimensions as we look at a new agenda for peace, a new vision for disarmament. So I'm really looking forward to a rich discussion today. And I'm really delighted also that we're doing this um, during uh, the week of our joint OSCE UN ODA Scholarship for Peace and Security. This is a joint initiative of our office and of the OSCE that is now in its fifth year. And we have in the room uh, 44 wonderful, powerful, dynamic, inspiring women from across the region. Uh, we've already had a couple of days of really rich discussions and really thrilled that they can be here with us today. But um, it's also my pleasure to welcome and introduce our moderator and our great panel. Uh, first and foremost, um, our moderator and MC for today, Melissa Fleming, uh, UN Undersecretary General for Global Communications. Uh, many of you here in the Vienna community know her well. I'm sure many of you participating online know her well too. She almost needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway and say a few words. Um, before taking her current position uh, in 2019, Melissa Fleming served uh, at the UN High Commission for uh, Human Rights as head for uh, global communications and spokesperson for the High Commissioner. And she was also a spokesperson and head of media and outreach at the IAEA. And prior to that, she headed the press and public information team at the OSE. So uh, a very uh, much experienced in all the different um, organizations that are part of this event uh, today as well. She's a frequent interview guest on international media platforms and her talks are featured on TED.com. She's the author of a book, A Hope More Powerful Than the Sea and a host of award-winning uh, podcast series, Awake at Night. I'm sure many of you have followed that uh, series. So really delighted to have you here, Under Secretary General. Um, and also our speakers, we have two of them in the room and two online. So I'll say a couple of words of introduction for them before I give the floor to uh, USG Fleming. So first, um, uh, I'd like to start again with, with our partners in this um, undertaking, the Republic of Ireland. We have with us His Excellency Ambassador um, Owen O'Leary. Welcome, um, Ambassador. Uh, many of you know, Ambassador O'Leary has been permanent representative of Ireland to the um, United Nations in Vienna for some time, and he's served in various capacities before that. He's been Ambassador of Ireland in the People's Republic of China, Ambassador to, to the Ru uh, Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. He's been quite a few places. <laughs> and he was also um, advisor to the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Director General for a United Nations Organization in the Ministry. Um, he was also Ireland's chair um, of the OSCE in 2012, um, and he chaired the Permanent Council of the organization. So welcome once again, Ambassador. Delighted to have you here. And we have joining remotely two colleagues, two wonderful colleagues, uh, Dr. Irina Georgiou, she's a legal advisor, uh, Arms Control and Con uh, Conduct of Hostilities Unit at the International Committee of the Red Cross, 
and Dr. Jojo is a legal advisor um, in that unit where she works among other issues on explosive weapons and populated areas and nuclear weapons issues. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss all of those uh, today. And Irini has several years of experience in multilateral disarmament and arms control diplomacy and negotiations, uh, also outside of the ICRC. And she's a licensed lawyer and holds a PhD in international law from University of Geneva. So welcome Irini, lovely to see you on screen. And also with us remotely is Per Lothammer, Iraq Chief of Mine Action for the UN Mine Action Service. Um, per has long uh, been leading actually this program for six years now. Um, he holds a Bachelor in Military Arts and a Master's Degree in International Co Cooperation and Humanitarian Aid. He's a key advocate and supporter for the Iraqi mine act in, uh, action sector, and he is often involved in coordination at the highest levels with the Iraqi government and UN family. And Pear has more than 33 years of military and humanitarian mine action experience and has worked in various roles in 14 countries, so not just in Iraq. These include um, the Demo uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Eritrea, Lebanon, Jordan, USA, and Kosovo. So great to have you with us as well, Pear. And we hope to, um, right now I think we can't see you, but we know you're there and we will see you uh, momentarily on the screen. And last but not least, one of our own uh, OSCE UNODA scholars for peace and security, and also one of uh, UNODA's leaders for tomorrow, uh, Vanda Pros uh, Proskova, who is the vice chair of Prague Vision Institute for Sustainable Security, and also um, the uh, co-convener of Youth Fusion. She's a fresh graduate of international law. And as I mentioned, she's one of uh, only 25 of uh, UNODA's leaders for tomorrow. This is our global um, initiative under our Youth for Disarmament campaign for engaging, educating, and empowering young leaders. And of course, one of our 44 scholars here in the room today. She is a sustainable security advocate serving as vice chair, as I mentioned, of the Prague Institute and co-convener of Youth Fusion. She is assisted with multiple platforms and programs, um, uh, including the PNND Gender Peace and Security Program. And she's worked mostly in that capacity in the nuclear disarmament field. And she's also currently working at Humanity in Action. She wears many hats, as you can see, where she helps to promote the incredible voices of democracy, justice, uh, and human rights advocates in different countries. So welcome to Vanda as well. So with that, um, once again, really delighted to have you all here. And I will hand over to Melissa to take us forward. Thanks so much. No, 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 no. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much, Rebecca, for that introduction and to, for introducing us to this important panel. Um, you know, in humanitarian imperatives and principles have long underpinned disarmament and also arms control efforts. Some of the earliest disarmament agreements established universal norms against weapons that cause unnecessary injury and also suffering. Going back to the 1800s, the St. Petersburg Declaration on Explosive Projectiles referred to the imperative of, quote, alleviating as much as possible the calamities of war. For some time, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons was colloquially referred to as the Inhumane Weapons Convention the inhumane. I think all weapons are inhumane. <laughs> um, today's event is an opportunity to hear from a wonderful group of panelists who were just introduced to you and to engage with all of you in the audience here at the Vienna International Center. Uh, welcome to all of you. And I think there are about at least 200 online who have tuned in. Thank you so much for listening in. We really want to engage with you in a frank interactive discussion on the role of humanitarian disarmament in advancing international peace and security. And we'll have a chance to talk about evolving frameworks, practical measures, and also partnerships to address and mitigate humanitarian consequences of the use of weapons of all types. The United Nations Secretary General, in his report to the General Assembly last year, which was called Our Common Agenda, among many other things, but very importantly, called for urgent solutions to international peace and security that integrate 
human, national, and collective security as mutually reinforcing elements. His proposed new agenda for peace and within this, his new vision for disarmament will require bold thinking and fresh ideas. And maybe we can come up with some of them here. I trust our conversation today can also bring inspiration and new perspectives for such a future vision and very much look forward to this exchange. And particularly, I want to acknowledge the presence of the 44 young women recipients of the 2022 OSCE UN ODA Scholarship for Peace and Security. All of you are in the room today and you're representatives of a new generation of leaders in this field. Maybe you can all stand up, the 44 of you who are. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes, you're one. You're one. Congratulations. Um, and with that, let's get started. And I would like to turn our to our first panelist today, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Ireland, Mr. Owen O'Leary, permanent you. representative of Ireland to the United Nations in Vienna. Over to you. Thank you very much, Melissa. And you know, thanks. I have a specific question, though. Do you want to be prompted or do you want to go right into it? Because I am told to ask you that we talked about humanitarian imperatives yes. and the need to protect civilians. And this having been long been the drivers of disarmament and ar armed control efforts. And just to point out, because you might not say this, that Ireland has been a steadfast supporter of humanitarian imperatives and the need to pr protect civilians as drivers of disarmament and armed control efforts. And your government will, on the 18th of November, welcome states to a high-level conference in Dublin to endorse the political declaration on strengthening the protection of civilians from humanitarian consequences arising from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. So from your perspective, what advances have we witnessed in strengthening norms and frameworks for humanitarian disarmament and what are the obstacles that remain? Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, indeed, I'll come to that question at the end I have. Um, before that, I might make, um, you can all hear me. We can hear I you and you have our permission. First of all, um, thanks to Rebecca Joven and the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs for organizing this conversation series. Um, at this time uh, of increased tension in the world, we need to talk more, not less. So these sort of meetings, this sort of scholarship program that we're witnessing the 44 graduates today, um, these are ever more important in making sure that we're having a conversation in the right space. And I'm delighted that uh, Ambassador Alessandra Cortez, who chaired the General Conference of the IEA uh, in September, is here with us. And uh, I think, Ambassador, you can testify to the fact that the conversation is a very difficult one at this time. And I'd also like to welcome my Swedish colleague, uh, Anika Markovic, for coming today. Um, the Ireland has, as you say, a strong humanitarian disarmament tradition, which forms a core part of our national identity and foreign policy. Indeed, promoting disarmament is one of our signature foreign policies. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to focus on recent work in the two areas of particular humanitarian significance, the one you mentioned, which is explosive weapons in populated areas, and the other is nuclear disarmament. Um, more than 30 years after the Third World War, after the Cold War, sorry, um, hopefully we never get to the Third World War, um, there are still, there are still an estimated 13,100 nuclear weapons. I think I'll repeat that actually, because 13,100 nuclear weapons on the planet. Because most of us think it's a handful, but when you put it, that figure down there, owned by nine states in the world, and this figure is likely to grow as the arsenal increases and modernization programs and the growing availability of nuclear technology uh, expands around the world. And indeed, within the IEA, we're fighting to stop uh, prol proliferation both in, in under the JCPOA, but also 
to r r r uh, slow the, the proliferation in the DPRK, for instance. Um, meanwhile, our understanding of the devastating humanitarian impact and development consequences associated with nuclear weapons has become much more sophisticated with a growing evidence base of the short and long-term harm caused to human life and health, the environment, biodiversity, climate change, amongst many fields. A nuclear weapons de detonation can not only cause massive immediate death and destruction, but in the aftermath, large-scale displacement and long-term damage to human health, the environment, infrastructure, and socioeconomic retrogression are among its catastrophic consequences. The impacts of nuclear weapons use are far beyond our capacity to respond, and so the only viable option is multilateral nuclear disarmament. Um, moreover, in today's heightened security environment, the threat of the use of nuclear weapons whether by intent, accident, or miscalculation, is the highest we have witnessed since the end of the Cold War. Russia's illegal, unprovoked, and unjustified war in Ukraine, together with all its uh, nuclear, nuclear rhetoric and military actions that compromise nuclear safety and security, threatened to undermine the global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime, and provoked devastating human humanitarian consequences. We have at the moment, for instance, four staff of the International Atomic Energy Agency in a nuclear plant in the middle of a war zone, which is a, would have been unthinkable a few years ago. It's a frightening thought that in the middle of a war zone with shells landing left, right and center, we have a fully one of the largest nuclear plants in the world. Achieving a world free from the threat of nuclear weapons has been a long-standing priority for Ireland. The Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, NPT as we call it, has its origins in a series of Irish resolutions first put forward at the United Nations in 1958. Back then, Ireland's Minister for External Affairs, Frank Aiken, addressed the fears of many across the globe about the existential threat posed by the existence of nuclear weapons. The same commitment to multilateralism that drove Ireland in the 50s and 60s informed the Irish uh, approach to the historic Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons negotiations in 2017. And we have with us here the Mexican ambassador, who is, uh, Mexico has just taken over as chair of the TPNW uh, members of state parties. The next meeting, I think, is to be in New York, Louis. So we look forward to that. In 2017, Ireland played a leading role in the process that led to the adaption of the TPNW. Following fruitful negotiations, defined by broad and diverse engagement of civil society and other stakeholders, the TPNW was adopted in 2017, ratified by Ireland in 2020, and entered into force in January 2022. And we had our first meeting in Vienna this year of the Conference of State Parties. Building on the strong foundations laid by the humanitarian initiative, which drew increasing focus on the humanitarian impact and the risks associated with nuclear weapons, the TPMW has achieved a historic first in the global disarmament agenda. It is the first legally binding international agreement to comprehensively prohibit nuclear weapons with the goal of their total elimination. At the landmark first meeting we had in Vienna this year, state parties adopted the Vienna Declaration and Action Plan outlining clear steps for the implementation of its humanitarian obligations, including on victim assistance and environmental remediation. And we stress all of us supporting the TVMW, this is not intended to undermine or replace the MPT infrastructure, it's intended to complement it because the MPT itself in Article 6 has a, 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 a name of eliminating, eliminating nuclear weapons, and we need to start taking this seriously, or do we have to wait till that number is 26,000 or 39,000? So the, the aim is to work with the entire global community, including nuclear, we nuclear weapons holders, uh, with a view to eliminating nuclear weapons over time. 
Applying gender responsive approaches to disarmament as with all other facets of our foreign policy is a key priority for Ireland. Most recently at the UN General Assembly's first committee, Ireland de delivered a state on behalf of nearly 80 member states from across all regions on the impact of strengthening and integrating um, a gender perspective across disarmament processes. The TPNW's recognition of the disproportionate effects of ionizing radiation on women and girls is a clear example of best practices in this regard. It is highly encouraging that discussions on humanitarian consequences are becoming more prominent and positive. We saw this at the 10th Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference with a large number of states from all regions calling for a strong reference to the issue. Unfortunately, we didn't agree a final document at the conference, but much of the language will act as a fund, as I say in German, a fund gruber that we can draw on in years to come. It is vital that the issue of humanitarian consequences avoids polarization and remains evidence-based, allowing all states to have a shared understanding of these consequences. As we build this understanding, it is vital that states, including those who rely on nuclear weapons and their security doctrines, integrate these considerations into their national policies. Nuclear risk reduction, while urgent and important, can never be a substitute for disarmament, and a risk, reduc risk reduction discussions must be firmly situated in the humanitarian consequences framework. Risk, after all, is not just a question of likelihood, but also needs to take account of the magnitude of the consequences. And here the scale of consequences is devastatingly clear. If a, if a conventional explosive goes off by accident, it is a tragedy. If a nuclear explosive was to go off by accident, it would be an absolute catastrophe. Um, let it be now turn to some of Ireland's most recent work in the field of conventional weapons, coming back to your question, Lisa, on the issue of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. IWIPA, unfortunately, it's not a very catchy acronym. Uh, we'll have to, to work on that. Uh, the world is becoming more urban, and unfortunately, we are also seeing as a result the increasing urbanization of armed conflict. There is growing concern about the protection of civilians and the consequences of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Beyond the immediate risk to civilian lives, Explosive weapons used in popular areas can disrupt the provision of essential services like food, medical care, and indeed, as we see in Ukraine at the moment, basic utilities such as uh, electricity and water. Uh, they, can influence, uh, they, they can inflict acute uh, damage in the natural environment and cause the forced displacement and destruction of cultural heritage. In response to the consistent appeals by the UN Secretary General and building on the Vienna Conference on Protection of Civilians in Urban Warfare, Ireland initiated consultations in 2019 with the aim of developing a political declaration to address the humanitarian harm arising from the use of IWIPA. We are, all, we are very pleased that next week, as you mentioned, on the 18th of November, and we hope to have a, a, a very high level of attendance of ministers from around the world. Uh, the international community has the opportunity to answer that appeal by endorsing the political declaration on strengthening the protection of civilians from the humanitarian consequences arising from IWIPA at the High Level Conference in Dublin. The declaration highlights the need to address the significant humanitarian issues associated with, with IWIPA. It outlines a framework for translating these commitments into practice by uh, ensuring that militaries explicitly consider the effects of their actions on civilians and civilian objects and uh, restricting and refraining, ref, refraining from the use of IWIPA accordingly on strengthening international cooperation and how to practically implement, implement these commitments and on facilitating humanitarian access, victim support and improved collection of data. 
Ultimately, these actions will go a long way to preventing and reducing civilian suffering. The political declaration will be a major step forward in this effort, and we look forward to welcoming representatives from states, international organizations, and civil society to Dublin to formally adopt the declaration. This work builds on Ireland's tradition of a humanitarian approach to conventional weapons, including our work on the Cluster Munitions Convention, which was adopted. Indeed, uh, we were one of the lead negotiators. To conclude, in the current global security environment where we bear witness to the appalling civilian consequences in conflict zones across the world, there is a renewed urgency for humanitarian disarmament in both conventional weapons and in the weapons of mass destruction categories. Despite the tremendous challenges we face, we must not lose sight of the value and promise of an approach that prioritizes human life and human security. It is our collective responsibility to step up to reinforce and implement international norms on the disarmament front and work to strengthen and universalize existing legal instruments. I can add more on the weep and uh, absolutely if no. Thank you, on. Ambassador, thank you. for that an incredibly thank comprehensive you. overview, both reminding us of, of uh, where we stand with nuclear weapons. Does everybody remember that number? Who wants to repeat it? The number of nuclear weapons in our world. I heard too many. I heard 13,000, but Thirteen thousand one hundred. Let's remember that number. Thirteen thousand one hundred nuclear weapons. Too many, right? And uh, also, thank you for introducing the the um, concept of um, conventional weapons in in populated areas. That is something that I think the world has woken up to in the context of the Ukraine war, very much so, and all the efforts that. Um, that your country is is making. We'll watch what happens in Dublin. Um, and thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to turn next to Dr. Irini Georgiou, legal advisor in the Arms and Conduct of Hostilities Unit at the ICRC. I'd like to hear how she introduces herself <laughs> when she meets new people. Um, yes, so uh, this is, of course, um, in and of itself, a leading voice for humanitarian principles, the ICRC, and as well approaches to disarmament. Dr. Giorgio joins us from Geneva today. Good to see you. And just uh, my question to you is, as, a means, as means and methods of warfare have evolved over time, what consequences do you see for upholding international humanitarian law, number one? And number two, how can the international community leverage and strengthen multilateral frameworks and tools as they relate both to weapons of mass destruction as well as conventional weapons. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you, even if only virtually. So hi to everyone from Geneva. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting the ICRC to take part in this important conversation. And thank you for your uh, questions, both very good and very important ones. So maybe to start by saying that, to put things a bit into perspective, the purpose of international humanitarian law is, of course, to put limits to violence in armed conflict and to protect those affected by armed conflict. And so in order to achieve its purpose, the law must apply in a meaningful manner to contemporary situations. It aims to regulate. In other words, it must be fit for purpose. And so international humanitarian law, or IHL, as we refer to it in shorthand, must evolve in parallel with how warfare itself evolves. This means it must evolve and keep track with advances in technology that have military applications. Think of artificial intelligence, think of human enhancement, machine learning, and so on. It has to also evolve in parallel with the development of new means and methods of warfare, new weapons and tactics. Think of autonomous weapon systems, for instance. But also in other cases, we have centuries old tactics of warfare like 
stages, or as Ambassador Leary mentioned earlier, heavy explosive weapons that continue to be used, but the environment has changed as the world becomes more and more urbanized. So the suffering of civilians multiplies. So in this case, we have the same old weapons, but a different environment, and still the law must regulate this changed reality on the battlefield. So how to achieve this? Um, sometimes this may require that the law develops. Either the interpretation of the rules is clarified or expanded to apply to these new situations, or even new law is created when there is a gap. And in any case, uh, the objective is to either prevent the civilian harm that is caused by these new weapons and tactics, so like preemptive legal regulation, or at least to respond in a timely manner. And this is by no means an easy process. Um, and the evolution of warfare poses a number of challenges to international humanitarian law. First, it's not always straightforward to determine whether we do need new law or we need better respect for existing law. This is the first challenge. Another challenge uh, refers more to substance. For instance, autonomous weapons. They challenge the very fundamentals of law and ethics including accountability, human decision-making. Uh, so IHL as it exists today is insufficient to address the problems these autonomous weapon systems pose. And this is why the ICRC in many states have called for new law in this respect. Then uh, the main challenge in creating new law, as we all know, of course, is current inter international dynamics and frankly, the lack of appetite among states for uh, new lawmaking exercises. And the rule or practice, depending of consensus, further complicates matters, as many of us unfortunately have seen time and again, those of us working on multilateral diplomacy at least. There's also often disagreement among states on how the law is to be interpreted and applied. I spoke earlier about old weapons and new realities. So in some cases, what it means and what it takes to respect the law today is different to what it meant and it took to respect the law, for example, half a century ago. Explosive weapons in populated areas. Urbanization has made their use in compliance with IHL more and more difficult, although the weapons themselves are not new. Or nuclear weapons that Ambassador O'Leary also spoke about. These are also old weapons, but today we know a lot more about their horrific consequences than we did know in 1945. And so today we can with absolute certainty that it's extremely difficult that nuclear weapons could ever be used in compliance with international humanitarian law. And now to get to the second part of your question on how to leverage and uh, strengthen the existing multilateral uh, frameworks on conventional weapons and weapons of mass destruction, because this is, is direly needed let me just make a few brief points, although there's a lot to say about this. Um, in the course of the last century, I would say, we have seen a massive change in how disarmament and international humanitarian law develops. States retain, of course, a crucial role, but they are no longer the sole actors that bring change. We've seen the rise of civil society. We've seen also a strong role by international organizations in treaty making and law interpretation. The International Committee of the Red Cross has also a special role in this respect. We have a mandate to work for the progressive development and clarification and strengthening of international humanitarian law. We've also seen the proliferation of soft law instruments like political declarations, manuals, guidelines. These are not legally binding but they can play a very important role in influencing the behavior of parties fighting in an armed conflict and can significantly strengthen the protection of civilians. And a very good example of this is the political declaration on explosive weapons in populated areas that was negotiated under the leadership of Ireland. And sometimes this kind of soft law approach is the most appropriate way to move forward. Other times, Treaty making is the most appropriate way. And despite the current climate, I would say it is still feasible and should not be discarded as an option. And the entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons proves 
how possible it is, even in the most difficult circumstances, um, to conclude a new treaty. This was a major collective achievement and a very good example of this new, new age of humanitarian disarmament that is shaped by really a variety of actors. So how to leverage and strengthen these existing frameworks and tools? I would say um, we have to be flexible and innovative. We have to be cooperative and join forces between a number of actors, states, non-state entities, civil society. We have to be aware and well-informed to document the humanitarian consequences of weapons, because this is where it all starts, to track the developments in uh, weapons and tactics and technology that may prove problematic for civilians. But above all, I would say we have to keep bringing attention back to the human-centered element of the law. Um, the purpose of the law is always, and of disarmament, to protect people, to protect civilians in principle, and to find this common good which can act as a common interest and facilitate multilateral uh, disarmament negotiations. And of course, uh, and this is my last point, to be optimistic because it's true that moving ahead, especially in the current climate is difficult. There is never an ideal moment for uh, international humanitarian law development, but I think somehow it always finds its way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for ending on a little bit a note of, of hope because um, I think your point also that we're, I think both you and Ambassador O'Leary mentioned that it really is all about people in the end. And maybe that's how we need to, to frame it. It's not the weapons, it's the people um, that we need to be focusing on. Same old weapons, we know how destructive they are in new places in more urban environments um, and how does international law work. Hopefully we can develop it. Thank you for sharing your insights and experience. The ICRC, of course, is an instrumental voice and actor in strengthening the protection of victims and also survivors of armed conflict and violence. And so hopefully we can come back to this dimension in our discussion. And I'll use this as a good segue to turn to our next speaker, um, the UN Mine Action Service Program Chief in Iraq, Per Lodhammer. Um, I know this issue is close to your heart. And it, when may I ask you, when it comes to operating, operationalizing humanitarian disarmament approaches, what have been the main challenges you've witnessed in the Iraqi context and in humanitarian mine action more generally? What models for partnership and inclusive participation have you found to be the most successful in improving impact and achieving more sustainable results? And maybe if you could just also just give us a sense of what context uh, you're working in in Iraq, you know, what is the situation? If we're bringing it back to humans and the humans who are having to um, navigate all of these minds that are endangering their lives day in and day out. Thank you. You are on mute, Peter, if you could just click that. Try again. Hmm. Can you try again? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank okay. you. Okay, excellent. So I will start again then. So uh, thank you very much for this, Melissa, and thank you also for this opportunity to join and speak today. Uh, both questions are, are very good, and just to add a little bit of, of context, uh, I mean, Iraq is very complex in all aspects, and especially when it comes to, to mine action. And uh, just to give you a very recent example, only 10 days ago, we actually had a lethal accident in, in Basra where I lost two of our staff to an antipersonal mine that, that detonated and had one injured. So it's, it's, it's very real work and, and it's realistic every day in what we do. And then to add up that, to that, of course, now we have a government, but we, have, we are dealing with a very po difficult political situation uh, also and security on top of that. So uh, it's complex, uh, but hard challenging, but also enormously rewarding. 
I think in, in terms of main challenges in Iraq, they have been technical in nature in that when we first commenced clearance of unexploded ordnance after ISIS had been defeated, or actually correction, in fact, already before they had been defeated, we encountered explosive contamination that mainly was improvised in nature and that had been manufactured by the Islamic State. We found improv improvised explosive devices, and it was said from the beginning when I was introduced by Rebecca, I worked in the sector for, for 32, 33 years now, and we found devices in quantities and with a complexity that I have never seen and that we as a community have never seen previously in the mine action sector globally. And this mainly in an urban and built up environment and with enormous amounts of debris and human remains mixed with a multitude of explosive items, thousands of them. In one location only, Al Shifa Hospital in Western Mosul, we cleared over 11,000 items of explosive ordnance. In this environment, one of the key challenges when we first started almost six years ago, it was to quickly train and establish national capacity. National capacity not only technically qualified to safely remove and clear explosive hazards, but that also had the prospect to become sustained financially and with women and men working side by side in all types of roles and on all levels. The last part proved to be a major challenge, not only because of social norms in Iraq, but also because generally the mine action sector globally has always traditionally been male dominated and most of us come from the military, we come from the, the police and that has been reflected, unfortunately. Uh, this is a challenge that we have, however, overcome through a lot of hard work with our implementing partners and engagement with the government of Iraq. And it has actually proved to be an opportunity also, because when something is bad, we can only improve it. And I think we've done that really well in in Iraq. For the sector, the mine action sector as a whole, a key challenge, I believe, is to maintain the momentum and donor interest to ensure that mine action programs remain sufficiently funded and preferably with multi-year funding so that capacity, such as the one I'm about to describe in a minute, can be trained and also retained. Another challenge is to encourage and ensure that affected states themselves as soon as they can financially contribute through transparent state budget allocations for national operational capacity. In response to the second part, I will briefly elaborate on the model we have opted to use in Iraq, the partnership model as we've labeled it. This model has been designed to create and build national capacity that will in the long term be localized, autonomous and fully self-sustained. To achieve this, we have over the last two years provided international NGOs with grants under which they have to partner with Iraqi national NGOs and build the capacity of the national NGO for a period of three years. We're now going into the third year uh, in, with this model. The model is including financial support and mentoring and training of the national NGO within eight different areas, including management, programming, operational and technical skills, support services, quality management, leadership, risk management and resource mobilization. And with this model, we aim to have two fully uh, independent national NGOs uh, operating by mid 2023. Important has also been to include gender mainstreaming as a common theme in all activities. And until now, we have 34 national uh, female staff fulfilling 26 operational roles, removing explosive devices, and eight women working in support functions with these operating teams. This is something that would have been almost impossible only six years ago. In 2022, we undertook a study to take a closer look at the gender mainstreaming work that we have undertaken and achieved in one of the governments uh, that is the most affected by explosive contamination. Nineveh in the north of Iraq. It turned out that through our work, we have slowly begun to change the attitudes regarding women's, women's participation in the technical mine action roles. 
Uh, we still have a long way to go uh, despite challenges, but despite these ch challenges, we have taken leaps over the, the last few years. And I will finish with a recent example to uh, um, exemplify this. I also want to mention here that, uh, just to put it in perspective, I was in Iraq the first time 22 years ago, uh, working in the mine action sector. And back then, it was impossible to have women in any technical roles whatsoever. So the figure of 34 uh, female staff working with operating teams, it might sound low, but to put it in perspective, it really is an achievement. Now to my recent example, just to exemplify the, challenge, the, the changes that we've seen. In early July this year, while en route to the work site in Nineveh, an explosive device detonated nearby a minibus used by a female search team working in an area called Talkeef, north of Mosul. The bus was carrying five women and three men. Fortunately for those in the minibus, the device detonated just under and behind the vehicle, leading to less damage and injuries than had it detonated directly under the vehicle. Despite this, all passengers of the bus required some medical attention and treatment. The injured were treated in the hospital and were released on the same day, but some of them with injuries that would take a couple of months to heal. Following this incident, my fear was that the female staff would not be allowed to come back to work again. And as I expected, families and relatives raised concerns and they did not want these women to return to work again. However, these women argued that their work was now more important than ever. And now, almost four months later, they have all been back working for three months and are more motivated than, than ever. As I said before, in this regard, we have made leaps. While seeing an increased number of qualified women competing for operational roles in Iraq is a crucial milestone. Going into three year, year three of the partnership model, UNMAS is also expanding the focus to further develop existing female capacity and to have further participation and not only in operational roles, but also and very important in managerial roles. And I will stop here. And again, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Pear. And uh, thanks for uh, yeah, bringing to life some of the stories around uh, the devastating impact that mines uh, have on societies in post-war societies. It means the wars linger on even for decades. I mean, I already am been told that Ukraine is very much um, mined and that that legacy is going to be something that you'll be dealing with as uh, UN Mine Action. Um, but also thank you for bringing in uh, that, that, that very motivating and inspirational story about the women who are working uh, for Mine Action in Iraq. Your colleague had told me recently that, that there are also women, um, believe it or not, working for UNMAS in Afghanistan. And um, I think you, I don't know how many women in this room feel inspired by that. It's dangerous, but really important. Yes, good. <laughs> but this is obviously, we need women at the peace table. We need women clearing minds. We need women in management uh, in, in these areas. So thank you. And I think inclusion and diversity in humanitarian disarmament these are issues also very dear to our next speaker, Ms. Vanda Proskova, who is currently with, as introduced, Prague Vision Institute and wearing many hats, including UNODA leader for tomorrow, as we just heard. So I'm gonna ask you, civil society, women's and increasingly youth organizations are at the front forefront of advocating for international efforts to restrict or restrain the use of weapons as a result of their humanitarian impact. So what role do you see for young people and non-governmental organizations in shaping policy for humanitarian disarmament and also for peace and security? Thank you, thank you for that question. I mean, what a question. And thank you to UNODA for including youth and women and the civil society in this very timely conversation. It's such an honor. Um, to be here. I think my answer is pretty simple. Um, youth and women are simply drivers of change. 
but to elaborate on that a little, um, I think um, recently the coronavirus pandemic has really undeniably demonstrated how um, the key issues of human security simply cannot be resolved successfully through military means or by nations alone, but rather require strong global cooperation um, and nonviolent conflict resolution. And this is something that women and youth have been advocating for long before any pandemic. Um, and is especially lovely to be saying this in, in the beautiful city of Vienna, um, one of the main homes of Bertha von Suttner, uh, the first woman laureate of the Nobel Peace Prize, but also, fun fact, um, the inspiration behind the award itself, um, but also um, a key person behind the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which is sort of a predecessor of the ICJ, um, and also the person thanks to whom we now have the Peace Palace in The Hague, where both courts sit. Um, so Britta, even though she was walking the streets of Vienna over, say, 100, 120 years ago, um, to this day, she continues to remind me that um, how big of an impact women and youth in the civil society can have on humanitarian disarmament, peace and security. Um, Britta was a woman of many hats, from a novelist to peacemaker, and really she continues to remind all of us that um, the role of youth and NGOs in general is really the flexibility and the creativity uh, we can allow ourselves. And I think that's what makes the civil society action so powerful. You know, we don't need a mandate um, to organize a film screening or an award. Um, we're not owned by huge lobbying corporations as some politicians could be. Um, and, and in Exhibit A, um, I think it was in 2009, um, all 40 um, Republican senators and one independent senators in the, in the US Senate, uh, they announced to President Obama uh, that they would support um, New START agreement with Russia, uh, that they wouldn't support it unless it was accompanied by an increase in nuclear weapon spending. So essentially they would say yes to lowering nuclear weapons uh, but only if we spend more on them. And just looking at the faces in the room, the math is not mathing. I know. <laughs> uh, but yesterday in the training, we touched upon the issue of money on multiple occasions. So I thought it would be a good place to bring this up as well, uh, specific specifically from um, the perspective of nuclear divestment or divestment in general, but um, nuclear divestment is sort of my background. Um, and it's a very good example of how um, civil society can have a direct impact on policy making, on humanitarian disarmament. Um, and it's, it's just fun to talk about the numbers. <laughs> so divestment, as the word suggests, is basically the opposite of investment. Uh, it is a pretty effective practice, uh, which by excluding investments in specific companies or organizations, institutions, one can put a pressure on an industry not fulfilling specific ethical, legal, or any other criteria. Um, the tactic became prominent in the 1980s, um, introduced to put pressure on the South African government, which by the way, got rid of its nukes. Uh, but more recently, after the 2015 Paris climate talks, um, a new divestment strategy led around I think 500 um, institutions commit to divest from fossil fuel companies. And I mean, that is a real tangible, tang tangible change. So when we talk about nuclear divestment, um, every year annually, we spend 100 billion USD on nuclear weapons alone. And to put that into perspective, I think the annual UN budget is about 6 billion. So it's really, nothing in comparison to what is being spent on nukes. Um, and just for a second, imagine what could be achieved in, in your communities if we spend just one, one second of the nuclear weapon spending on something, something we truly need. Recently with the pandemic, hospitals, um, schools, I don't know, wind turbines, whatever um, to help us get and achieve the sustainable development goals faster. Um, so the good news is, and this is where the civil society um, comes in, is that anyone can put a pressure on this industry through nuclear divestment. Um, so for example, put a pressure on their bank to start acting ethically and stop investing into these um, nuclear weapon profiting corporations. 
Um, if that's something that interests you, um, Don't Bank on the Bomb does fantastic research on, on how what, what banks do well and, and what don't. Uh, but we can also write letters to our universities or churches with investment portfolios or put pressure on whole cities and governments um, that have, for example, pension funds. Uh, here, Move the Nuclear Opens Money campaign can help you with that. And it's pretty amazing because it works. Good examples of um, cities are, for example, Hanover in Germany or Cambridge in, in Massachusetts in the States. Um, but even whole governments uh, such as Switzerland or New Zealand have adopted policies that prohibit um, investments into nuclear weapons and really putting a punch into the nuclear weapon industry, which is, which is pretty great. Um, I think to go back to the question, Youth and NGOs are also incredibly good at thinking outside of the box um, and bringing attention to the matter and often you know, giving governments the push they need. Uh, I mean, we've seen this with the TPNW, for example, recently. And they're also being very creative with it, uh, which is why I enjoy to be part of the civil society. Um, for example, we've got with Youth Fusion an upcoming project titled Nuclear Fear, you know, which is telling true stories about the eight decades of nuclear madness. Um, through an animated film, but also an interactive platform in multiple languages and really focusing on the real impact uh, the nuclear chain has had on, on humans around the world. Um, so it is an incredible, society is just an incredible powerhouse. So to conclude where we started, um, just looking at the time, I know um, we, should, we should go to the um, dialogue part of this event, but really young people and civil societies truly are the driving change. Um, without their efforts, energy, advocacy, um, activism, um, this world would simply be stuck, I think. So thank you for bringing the youth, the women, the civil society into this conversation. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much, Vanda. Uh, um, nuclear divestment, I think that's something that we can all get behind. And I, I, it's really interesting to hear those examples of what is happening. I think we've heard similar examples around fossil fuel, but not very, not very well known around in the nuclear space. So thank you for injecting that, um, those, those, those examples and also um, a role model. Can you say her name again from because I don't know if everybody caught it. Okay, y'all. Berta von Suttner, the absolute role model. Um, she's published her novel, Lay Down Your Arms. Um, the first Nobel, she was the... Yeah, she's, she's on, on the, the two-euro Austrian coin. Okay, mm -hmm. Berta yeah. von Suttner. Yeah, yeah. The love Lay interest down your of arms. Alfred Nobel. <laughs> okay, the love interest of Alfred Nobel. Okay, we even have, good. <laughs> You're full, full of fun facts. So thank you, and uh, that, that helps. So. Thank you, everyone, for listening so intently to all these angles that we've had um, introduced to us. And now we'd love to open the floor to you. And if you would then identify yourself and uh, direct your question, say who you'd like to direct your question to. We have roving mics. Um, so just raise your hand high and you will receive them. We're also accepting questions from online. And Rebecca will then let us know. Um, what those are, but who wants to ask a question? Make a comment. This is not possible. Yes, I knew it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I just had to say that I smiled at your reference of Bertha von Suttner because it's someone I have worked on a lot. Um, I'm Elsa, by the way, I'm one of the scholars for peace and security. And there's a great book called The Women Behind the Nobel Peace Prize. It's an author that I've worked with a lot. She's a Norwegian author, but it's available also in English. So if you want to know a bit more what she's talking about, um, that's a great book to read. Um, so I don't know if I really had a question. I just uh, jumped at the opportunity to say, to say that. Um, what she did, um, allegedly, according to two letters that, that had been analyzed, is she inspired 
Alfred Nobel, who was um, the inventor of dynamite, and he had a very realist perspective on um, on the world. So if, if if one country is armed, others must also be to to deter each other. And she really believed in, in peace congresses um, as a counter to that. Um, so I think, is there any way to sort of um, um, disarm everyone without, I mean, can we really disarm one um, and then still feel safe or must, mustn't we disarm everyone at the same time? Is there anyone that really will take that first step um, towards nuclear disarmament? How can we really, um, is there hope for that? I, I hope the answer is yes. <laughs> and please, uh, yeah. That's a very good point. And I look forward to reading that book because I've always been interested in Berta von Suttner um, herself and the two uh, Irish peace women, uh, Maureen Corrigan and Betty Williams, stand out as people who, women who push for peace in the difficult time. Yes, of course, disarmament, unilateral disarmament is very difficult. Um, which is why we do political declarations like IWIPA and so on. I think the, the key point is to create a space where people can engage with the idea of disarmament. For instance, when Frank Aiken originally proposed his Irish resolutions in the late 1950s, it was seen as rather quixotic. You know, it, this was at the height of the arms race. And then you had the Cuban Missile Crisis. And people said, oops, this might actually end the whole shebang. My parents, for instance, I was three and a half in October 1962, and I have a memory of my parents talking about staying up all night during the Cuban Missile Crisis, waiting for the American president, you know, to tell us whether there would be a war tomorrow. And out of that then, I think, and other impulses, people came and developed the MPT and the New Start and the, the disarmament agenda that's there in the nuclear uh, sphere. It's not effective enough, it's not good enough. But the important thing is that people like NGOs, people like the experts had been working in the background. It's like IWIPA didn't come out of a vacuum. There had been a long series of, of initiatives by Germany and many others. Um, you know, uh, the UNGA First Committee joint statement, and that created a space where you could reach a political declaration. One of my great regrets in the OSC, when I arrived as ambassador to the OSC in September uh, 2007, the uh, Convention of Forces in Europe Treaty, which was one of the most advanced and effective conventional disarmament treaties ever negotiated on the planet was suspended by Russia at the time. And at the time, there was a view we'll be suspended for six months and then we'll come back to it. And there were efforts uh, culminating in a very concerted effort at the Astana summit in 2010 to revive the Convention of Forces in Europe Treaty, which had very strict limits on the number of weapons you could have east of the Euro west of the Urals between the Atlantic and the Urals and so on, the number of armed forces and so on, and they failed. And hopefully when the war uh, in Ukraine ends and every war ends, and hopefully when we move on to the post-conflict situation, there will be a space where we can come back to these really effective conventional forces treaties, not just in Europe, but worldwide, but Europe was very much the, 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 the beacon in this area with the, the treaty, with the various OSC documents, like the Vienna document, all of which now are in serious trouble, of course. But, you know, out of this conflict, those of us who work in this army should be ready to push again the buttons to get across the people that if you have a lot of guns and you have a lot of bombs and you have a lot of soldiers, there is a real danger somebody is going to use them. And the best way to avoid that is to reduce the number of guns and weapons and soldiers. As you say, it's very difficult to do that unilaterally. Um, I, I, I'm an eternal optimist. For instance, the Helsinki Final Act came uh, only uh, uh, seven years after the Soviet, the 
occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1968. So hopefully in seven years' time, we will be talking about a new wave of uh, conventional and nuclear disarmament across the planet. Thank you. Let's, let's hope, and maybe even before seven years. Yeah. Let's open the floor again for further comments, questions. Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Agnesa, I'm from Italy and Albania, and I'm a scholar of OSCE and NODA. I have a question for the expert on demining, but also anyone else who I think might jump in. I was wondering whether um, technological advancement could help make demining more safe and secure, or whether that's not available, perhaps because of mm, slow technological advancement on that side, or whether the the new weapons are way too technologically advanced that we cannot catch up, or is the human side on finding, I, I don't know how the practice works, but um, whether demining needs to be this unsafe for humans, or can it be overcome with technology? Thanks. Hair, are you still there? I, I'm still here, and uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. So I think, first of all, with each new conflict, we see a new threat, um, to some degree, at least that the threat is changing. And in the case of Iraq, we saw that conflict had completely almost moved into urban environment. Uh, it was mainly improvised, and still is, improvised explosive devices, um, and in combination with a lot of other challenges. Uh, when it comes to the technology that we're using, it is really very much the same that we used in 1945, 1946 with handheld metal detectors that have developed. They're more comfortable now, they're more sensitive in that they're picking up smaller metal amounts and to a greater depth. Uh, mechanical equipment has developed, but it's still not very different from what we used then. We're using animal detection systems with rats, dogs, and uh, and uh, other types of other animals. But other than that, it hasn't changed that much. The, the biggest change lately, I would say, is that we have ground pen penetrating radars that are combined with metal detectors. That's probably one of the biggest advancements over the last 10 years. And then that we're starting to use flying cameras or drones much more not in a detection role but in a role where you use them to gain insight you, you can fly into buildings you can fly over areas and get a better overview uh, but it, it's a it's a very val valid question and i think we need to to look at especially drones how we can get them to carry detection systems and combine detection systems also uh, i can see that in, in Ukraine and the challenge there is going to be the massive amount of burnt out um, uh, uh, armored vehicles, uh, tanks, uh, armored personnel carriers. A lot of them have ammunition inside of them. We're talking thousands of them. And that in combination with a lot of new technology that has been used there as well in terms of, of landmines, in terms of missiles, etc. But the advancement, it, it's slow, it is. Uh, and I think we also need to look beyond technology. Uh, it, for the mine action sector as a whole, the biggest advancement has probably been that we are much better at reducing huge areas and confirm that there are no explosive hazards. Release land, we call it land release, uh, in doing so. So we become better at collecting information and then translating that into contamination or no contamination, instead of clearing big and large swaths of land where there is no contamination and deploying men and women and equipment that is very expensive to use. Um, but we need to continue, we need to, uh, to advance when it comes to technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pear. If I may, a follow-up question for those, maybe just to have a little amusement here, for those of us who don't appreciate rats very much, can you please tell us about the role of rats? How do they detect landmines? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there's only one organization who's using them. It's an, uh, a Belgian NGO. They're using them in a number of countries. It's a giant pouched uh, rat that is used uh, because of its size. But 
the rat will detect just like any other animal detection system using uh, its, its nose as a sensor and it will be trained on different types of explosive compounds and then it's working together with a with a rat handler of course it's not as attractive as being a, a dog handler maybe uh, but it is a system that is working quite well uh, unfortunately s many donors are, are reluctant in funding uh, rats but but they've made a lot of progress and and rats are u working really well and it's a very cheap system also uh, they're very easy to bond with they, they they're easy to feed cheap to to feed and they they live for a long time and very sociable animals also uh, so it's interesting we'll see where it goes and where it ends in let's say five or ten years thank you we need a new appreciation for rats obviously so thanks for that pair and uh, rebecca has a a uh, question that came to us from our online audience. Yes, we actually have a couple. So if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll um, throw a couple out here and our panelists can think about this as well as they um, think about other issues they, they want to conclude on. So we, we have a couple. Um, uh, one from a uh, UNECA fellow from Chad, uh, Kinga Nadesh uh, Kular, who asks, how can civil society organizations from the South, from the global South, contribute to global disarmament efforts? I think that's a really important question as we talk about uh, the global efforts and uh, uh, cross-regional efforts. Um, also, one of our uh, former UN youth delegates for Ireland and, and also a fellow has asked about um, how we can empower young people in the areas of disarmament. Vanda, you already gave us a couple of uh, ideas, but how can we have their voices and experiences heard in the humanitarian disarmament discussion? And then um, finally, uh, Rafael Moretto, uh, researcher with the uh, uh, Strategic Hub for Organized Crime Research and the Royal, Inst uh, Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, is asking a two-part question. Um, uh, one on uh, looking at you know, the evolution of the realities that we've just discussed and heard from our panel. Um, and uh, looking at actually revising and then advancing humanitarian disarmament. First of all, what do you uh, panelists see as best practices to replicate? And then perhaps a bit on the flip side of things, how do we also work against some of the negative trends such as those that have to do with the diversion of uh, humanitarian aid or uh, illicit uh, diversion uh, or use of weapons um, when delivered in communities that may um, uh, be, uh, be um, uh, dominated by, um, by conflict or uh, within regions that are um, controlled by warlords or other uh, uh, non-state actors. So how do we deal with some of those challenges to avoid um, a per perpetuation of armed conflict and violence? So a lot of questions going a lot of different directions, but some food for thought, I hope. Thanks, Rebecca. I think what I would suggest is, because we have 13 minutes left that we do one last round of our panelists to to see if you feel that you can address all of those questions or at least some of them and any any last thoughts that you'd like to deliver. And I'm going to go to Vanda first because I'm going to go in reverse order over to you. All right. So just to address some of the um, the questions from um, the online space. Uh, well, just going to wrap up at Youth Fusion, but we're a global network um, for not just youth, but also the not so young, um, but also organizations. And we also work with people from the global south. So um, youth-fusion.org slash join. Um, as to youth, empower, and I mean, there's at this time many, many, many fora that um, young people from the global south can, can join as well. Um, on youth empowerment, um, We've talked about education and the training as well, but also bringing young people to the table. I think these days it's so so important to also promote the fact that it's not just you know the professionals and the young people, but the young people now can be the experts as well. Um, so really keeping up with that um, and giving them the space um, they they deserve. Um, and finally, you know, um, as a, as a, as a, as a young person um, sometimes we simply do need help we need we do need the help of the, from the people in the in the current um, seats in the offices um, so yeah support young people in, in your networks and again thank you to you know da for for supporting you through um, youth um, for disarmament and other spaces um, there are many options for young people to get involved these days um, and just some final 
uh, final thoughts on uh, to conclude. Um, accessible disarmament education, I think, would be a good um, final thoughts to to conclude on. We can learn from New Zealand. We can leave from the Marshall Islands. It works. We just really need to push for, for, for it. Um, I would also like to highlight um, linking um, not just nuclear disarmament, but disarmament in general to the climate change. Um, we um, maybe it's, it's saving this for a different different um, conversation, um, but really linking the two and bringing more attention to, to nuclear disarmament and highlighting it that way. You know, the, the famous quote that war fuels climate change and climate change fuels war. So a lot of that. And then just thinking outside of the box, um, so thank you for doing precisely that, um, for creating these new ways to involve the youth, women, um, civil society, um, and thank you for having me. Well, th thank you, Vanda. And uh, I think your point about not just in including youth and women as, as a kind of consultative mechanism, but really we need your expertise. Um, and I think we got a lot of expertise from you. Any tips you can give our colleague from the Global South on how to get involved? But with what we saw with the, the youth climate movement, um, we have many Gretas uh, in the Global South um, who are amazing activists. And then your link, uh, your linking um, climate activism uh, with disarmament, I think is, it's very interesting. It is about protecting our planet and it's all about protecting our humanity. Um, so yeah, there are huge links. And we feel, I think, as, as adults and those who've been in this space for many years, that we, we need energy, we need a movement, and we need involvement of, um, of everybody. So thank you for what you do. Um, I, I think I'm going in reverse order. As my memory is correct, it's Pear. <laughs> Pear is next. Do you have anything you'd like to add uh, from those three online questions or just one final thought, Pierre? Yeah, ab absolutely. So just on the last question that, that was posed very, very quickly. So Iraq, we, as a, as a country, they are a state party to the Anti-Personal Mind Bank Convention with a deadline of 2028. They will not, in my view, be able to achieve this uh, because the, they're there is multi-layer contamination in Iraq from the Iran-Iraq war along the whole border, the two Gulf Wars, and then internal conflict, and now lately the conflict with, with uh, the Islamic State. So that will not be possible to achieve, unfortunately. And ultimately, uh, it is a governmental responsibility. It's a, it is a responsibility of the government of Iraq, and we are there to make sure that the government of Iraq can achieve the deadlines that they have so, uh, that they have subscribed to. Uh, and then the, the last question about women in, in mine action, and mine clearance, I think there are only opportunities to be honest, but the biggest challenge is probably that many of the men have the um, training and the skill set from, from the army and from having done this in, in the past. Uh, so bringing them up to senior technical level is probably one of the key challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pear, and thank you very much for participating from Iraq and for all the important work you do in keeping the population safe there. Um, so let's move to ICRC again. Dr. Irini uh, Giorgio, would you like to respond to anything you heard or any final thoughts? Sure, thanks a lot. Um, I wanted to add one element in response to the question about best practices in advancing disarmament. And I'd like to say that, uh, in my perspective, it's very important, in addition to engaging civil society and, of course, youth, the younger generation, it is very important to engage also survivors. Um, and by engaging, I mean really engaging the communities affected by the different weapons whose effects we are striving to prevent or redress in designing the responses and the, um, the frameworks of victim assistance. And this is because certainly for the ICRC, but also for many states, it's very important to have those affected by these weapons, not just as recipients of 
victim assistance, what we call victim assistance, but also as active participants in uh, those frameworks of assistance and using their experience to better to better um, address the humanitarian impacts of these weapons. So engaging survivors um, has been crucial so far in the, in the field of nuclear weapons and uh, also a number of other weapons like landmines and cluster munitions. And then maybe a point to the question on how to prevent the diversion of humanitarian aid. I mean, this is a very hard question. And as ICRC, obviously, we are faced with a major dilemma in this respect. On the one hand, humanitarian aid needs to reach those uh, civilians um, and others that are in dire need for assistance. So we cannot just stay out of certain contexts because there is a practice or a risk of diversion. We have to keep trying to reach those people. From a legal perspective, there are, of course, very clear rules about uh, what states and non-state armed groups can and cannot do in order to ensure that the, the aid reaches the people in need. But uh, the point I wanted to make is that those states that support the different parties to armed conflicts, whether through military alliances or other forms of support, be it weapons or financial or other support, they have an important role to play in exercising influence on those parties also in terms of influencing them to allow essential humanitarian life-saving humanitarian assistance to reach the people in need. This is why these support relationships and partner operations are gaining more and more importance in our days. And so it's essential that um, those states engaged in those partnered operations, those support relationships also exercise their influence in this respect. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Uh, much appreciated, Irini. And last but not least, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Turn this on. Um, yes, uh, on the use, uh, I think the onus is on governments to ensure that youth are represented. We managed during our membership of the Security Council to bring the CTPTO to the Security Council. It was the first time, apparently, the executive secretary of the CTPTO addressed the Security Council, uh, as did Izumi Nakamitsu, is at the head of UNODA. But we also had a representative of youth for the CTPTO, a, a young woman from Kenya whose name I, I don't now remember. So it gave a very good perspective. And I think we just need to build that into our thinking. On the Global South, TPMW, for instance, is very much a Global South Treaty. It's, it's interesting, practically Ireland and Malta, I think, are the only two, and Austria are the only three European states that ratified it. So we shouldn't assume that the Global South is a treaty taker in that sense. A lot of, a lot of the innovation, for instance, in nuclear-free zones in South America and so on would be in the less developed part of the world at that time. You know, they, they, they've they actually pushed ahead of global trends. I think where the developing world really has to answer is that it hasn't controlled the sale of weapons into the global south. Because when you see the pictures from conflict zones around the, the developing world, it's mainly developed world weapons that these, the, the soldiers and uh, various armed groups are using. And we need to do a lot more. We, we've done the arms trade treaty and so on, but we need to do a lot more in that regard to control sale of, of uh, both conventional, mainly conventional weapons indeed, to, to the developing world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh panelists, ambassador, colleagues in the room and online. Um, thank you for listening and taking part in this incredibly rich and thought provoking discussion today. And it's, for me, it's been really also educational and inspiring um, to be your moderator. So I hope we can continue this kind of exchange and let's all work together toward a vision for disarmament that puts people and our common humanity at the center 
my appreciation to UNODA, the Republic of Ireland, and also UNIS Vienna, as well as to our distinguished panel. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you.